from your hometown election headquarters, KHQ and the Spokesman Review are pleased to present the first town hall with the candidates for the 5th Congressional District. Eastern Washington's Congressional District stretches from the vast evergreen forests bordering Canada to the north and the rolling hills of the scenic Palouse to the south. It encompasses 10 counties and 16,053 square miles. Its largest city, Spokane, is an urban center surrounded by wheat farms, sprawling national forests, and the basins of the Snake and Columbia Rivers. The 5th District's political history has been marked by periods of single-party domination, followed by change. Over the past century, both Republicans and Democrats have represented the people of Eastern Washington in our nation's capital. Republican Walt Horan and Democrat Tom Foley each held the seat for decades before voters selected a candidate from the rival party. This year's contest has been one of the nation's most closely watched congressional races. And the region's residents are keenly interested too. Voters turned in more ballots for the August primary than for any other contest here in the past 14 years. The race has focused on key issues such as tax reform, assistance for veterans, higher education, forest management, and gun control. Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers is seeking her eighth term in Congress. Born in Salem, Oregon, she calls Spokane home by way of Kettle Falls and Colville. She has climbed the GOP ranks to become chair of the House Republican Conference. Her career in politics began in the Washington State House of Representatives in 1994, as she succeeded Republican George Nethercutt as the district's representative in Congress in 2005. Democratic challenger Lisa Brown, an Illinois native, also began her political career in the Washington State House of Representatives. She went on to the Washington Senate, where she served as majority leader from 2005 to 2013. Brown lives in Spokane and taught economics at Eastern Washington and Gonzaga universities before becoming chancellor of Washington State University in Spokane in 2013. She gave up that title prior to her run for Congress. Tonight's town hall is the first time the candidates have appeared together on the same stage. They will be in conversation with Kip Hill of the Spokesman Review and Sean Owsley from KHQ. Please welcome Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers and Lisa Brown to the Northwest Passages stage. Good evening and welcome inside the Bing Theater. Good evening to all of you that are here and all of you that are watching at home. We say welcome. Well, the goal for the next hour is to have an informal, cordial, and lively conversation about the issues. In order to get to as many questions as possible, we're asking each candidate to keep their responses to one minute and any rebuttal to 30 seconds. Let's get started. We did flip a coin. Ms. Brown won the coin flip and chose to defer the first question. First question is you to you, Representative McMorris Rogers. Why are you the best candidate at this given time to represent the 5th Congressional District? All right, well, first of all, it's great to see everybody. And I, I've been humbled and honored to represent this district in Congress. My approach has always been to imagine what's possible and then work hard to make it happen. You know, uh, for me, it started, well, I kind of look back to my great, great, great grandma who headed west on the Oregon Trail in search of a better life. She, uh, she's someone that I, a woman that I admire. And, you know, she left an abusive husband. She, she headed out with twin sons in search of a better life. And that search continues today. I am proud uh, to have worked in a way to grow jobs, grow our economy right here in Eastern Washington. We have record, or record employment today because the job is the opportunity. I'm also someone that's worked in a bipartisan way. I've had 10 bills pass the House this year, five signed into law. And in fact, 68% of the bills that President Trump has signed this year have been bipartisan. It is the largest, the highest number in 20 years. So there's good things happening. And my approach is always to listen, to understand the issues, and then to get results. Thank you. Ms. Brown, why are you the right person and what will you do to represent the 5th District right now? Well, I agree. Thank you everyone for being here, everyone who's participating. A special shout out to students and teachers and staff that are back at school, to our armed forces and veterans. 
Um, we need change in our nation's capital, and we have the opportunity in November to create change in the leadership of Congress. And this Congress just isn't getting the job done. It's uh, paralyzed by special interests and dark money, uh, lurching from one government shutdown to another, not taking on the issues that people really care about. I've got a track record of working with community and business leaders to get things done for Eastern Washington. And the results of that are all around us from Sally's house at the Salvation Army to the WSU Medical School. Most importantly, I will do something that Kathy cannot and will not do. And that is, I will stand up against this administration and hold it accountable when it does things that are wrong or harm Eastern Washington. Let's go to the first uh, uh, sort of uh, policy type question. This is for Representative Morris Rogers. Um, you've said, and this is about health care. You've said that the Affordable Care Act has failed on its promises, that you would want to change it in several ways, um, repeal it in, in some votes. Um, if the Affordable Care Act is bad policy, Republicans have controlled both houses of the legislature now for two years. The, the White House, why haven't we seen a replacement policy to this point? Well, you have seen a replacement policy. I guess approved. Uh, what's that? Approved. Through. Well, uh, I voted for a replacement in the House. Mm -hmm. uh, I am someone that is committed to ensuring that everyone has access to quality and affordable health care. Uh, I am concerned that so many in Eastern Washington continue today to have double-digit premium increases, families and small business owners, you know, that is not fair that they continue to see those double-digit premium increases, co-pays, deductibles, deductibles that are $5,000, $8,000, you might as well not have health insurance. So we need to address affordability. We need to address access. Um, we need to have more choices for individuals and families. That's where I have supported and it has passed the House uh, Association Health Plans allowing for across state lines, uh, health savings accounts. But health care, I want health care also. I want to make sure America leads the world, that we have the best health care system in the world, and that we're innovative and we're curing diseases. I've, I'm proud to have led on 21st century cures, and I want us to focus on being the leader in curing diseases, not just uh, figuring out how we are going to pay for it. Ms. Ms. Brown, I'll, I'll let you respond to that. I have a specific question for you, and then you'll both get a chance to re respond to each other's answers. Um, Democrats have proposed a Medicare for all type system. Um, it's unclear, I think, or I, I haven't heard a clear answer. Where do you stand on that policy that Democrats have proposed? Do you support a Medicare for all type system? Well, first of all, let me say that repeal and replace is a political slogan. It is not a solution for health care. And as I've traveled throughout eastern Washington, it's the uh, either unwillingness or inability of Congress to take on the cost of health care and the cost of prescription drugs that has people most insecure about their future. And there are solutions. We could strengthen Medicare, uh, not voucher it. We could build on Medicaid, as I did in the legislature, uh, not block grant it. We have a very different record here. I voted for the Children's Health Plan uh, at the state level. Kathy voted against it. I voted to protect people with pre-existing conditions. She voted against it. And now's the time to move forward. Uh, what she calls solutions of allowing more substandard insurance plans to be sold into our markets does not give people the safety and security that they desire. I wouldn't want those plans for my family. I don't think you'd want them for yours. The people of Eastern Washington deserve something better. I, I appreciate that statement. If I could give you 30 seconds, the Medicare for all type system, where your, what's your stance on that? Uh, I think we need to strengthen and expand Medicare. I think Medicare, I think they call it Medicare X for all, where families and businesses could buy in. Now that would provide real competition to the insurance industry. And I think that's where we need to start, not going back backwards as the current Congress is, but moving forward with what already works. Um, a rebuttal to uh, what uh, Ms. Brown said about the, the efforts in the House so far on health care uh, yes. and your votes. Yes. Well, 
Uh, I, I believe that we need to strengthen Medicare. I don't support cutting Medicare or Social Security, despite what some have, have said. I believe that we need to strengthen it. You know, try to find a new patient or a new doctor today in Eastern Washington who will take a new Medicare patient. It's very difficult because Medicare doesn't actually pay the cost. It's a promise, and it's a promise that we need to make sure that we keep and we maintain to our seniors. But unfortunately today, that is, that is difficult. And so we need to make sure that we're strengthening Medicare. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, seniors have that confidence. And I have, I've been a part of a solution in, in Congress on, on these issues and others. Can I uh, rebut uh, on I, that one? I will give each one 30 more seconds to rebut on that because okay. I did ask a follow-up question. So Great. Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, in fact, you did vote for the Ryan budget that calls for cuts to Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid, and have discussed vouchering. Um, the Medicare program, uh, creating ability to divert from the Social Security system into private plans and block granting Medicaid. If Medicare isn't paying enough to some providers, and that could very well be the case, I understand the formulas vary across the country, then let's dig in and fix the formula. As an economist, that's what I love to do. I helped improve the formula for child care here in Eastern Washington. Let's fix the formula for Medicare so it works for rural Eastern Washington. And Congresswoman. Okay, so I've been a problem solver on, on Medicare right now. I am leading to get home health care cuts restored, cuts that were due to the Affordable Care Act. I have led on the Children's Health Insurance Program. We got it extended for 10 years. That was the longest ever that we ever got that extension. I have led on addressing the cost of prescription drugs, not just rhetoric, but actually legislation to call for transparency and accountability of our pharmacy benefit managers, where that's where you see the real costs going up. You see on issue after issue, I understand these issues and I'm committed to making a difference for the people of Eastern Washington. Uh, and I respectfully ask that we stick to our times allotted. Thank you very much. Uh, Congress has agreed for you, Representative McMorris Rogers, Congress has agreed on the biggest VA budget yet this month. Closer Look outlines the concern that the agency still does not have long-term funding solution. A ranking Democrat, Tim Waltz, told Stars and Stripes, we haven't done our job. We'll experience a shortfall within the next year. Hmm. What are you doing to find a long-term funding solution? We're talking decades. Well, I'm proud to have just supported the largest budget ever for the Veterans Administration, $202 billion. It's actually doubled in the last decade, so I'm not sure what exactly he's talking about. Uh, making sure that our veterans get the care that they need has been a long time top priority for me. For those who have served in our military, put on the uniform, defended our freedoms, given us the, the, the quality of life, the standard of living that we enjoy every day as Americans, I don't think that we can do enough for them. And too often when a veteran contacts the VA today, they, they do not get the red carpet rolled out for them. They, they have trouble getting a, a, an appointment scheduled or their benefits. And my office, every week, we are helping 30 to 40 veterans. They contact me needing help. I'm, I'm proud, even earlier this week, we were celebrating the urgent care is open again at the Spokane VA. And they are committed to making that 24 seven. This has been a priority, will, be, will continue to be a priority because I don't think we can do enough for our veterans. Ms. Brown, what is your long-term solution for funding veterans health care? Well, let me just say if 30 or 40 veterans are contacting the office a week, the system isn't working. And that's what I've heard from veterans throughout Eastern Washington. And it's not about the, the number of dollars put in, it's about the results on the ground. And in fact, emergency room service 24 seven has gone away uh, under the Congresswoman's watch. Uh, uh, one-day clinics for veterans in Northeast Washington, in Colville has gone away, and they are not getting the services that they d need. And the, re the reason is that Congress passed a huge tax break, created a trillion dollar deficit, and now is not making the commitments to the VA system or to other social safety net programs that it should be making. We can certainly do better, and veterans have told me that the CHOICE program, so-called CHOICE program that was much heralded a few years ago, actually resulted in them getting referrals that may have been positive,
positive, but then they ended up with bills that were unexpected. So once again, these are not promises kept, and we don't measure success by the number of dollars that went into the recent appropriation. Do I get a rebuttal? Oh, yes. Yes? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I agree that it's not just about the money. I believe that we need to look at the culture and the structure at the VA. And, and that is where I have made a difference. We, we have a 24-7 urgent care that will be open. This year, we, we discovered a leak at the Spokane VA in the lab that had been there for five years and no one had even taken any action or let someone know. We discovered that and we got it fixed. I have led on self-scheduling. The legislation for self-scheduling for veterans is pretty common sense, but uh, it's used in the private sector, but the VA has been resistant so that you can uh, um, get your appointment on your app or on an iPhone. If you want to call the one and header number, you can. But these are, all, these are just some of the solutions that I have um, led for veterans in Eastern Washington. Ms. Brown? Sorry, but after 14 years, veterans will tell you that service has declined, not improved. And they don't uh, fault the staff or, or medical providers at the VA system. They fault the structure itself. And in fact, the Congresswoman introduced a bill um, that was supported by Concerned Veterans of America that was the beginning of the private of the VA. Uh, I come from a family of three generations of veterans. My husband's a Navy veteran right here. I will not privatize the VA. We can get better results for our veterans here in Eastern Washington. I do want to say we are going, going over our time on each answer. I respectfully ask you stick to the time so we can get as many questions in. In that interest, let's, let's move on to, to the next topic, and it is about this investigation that's going on at the, the federal level into Russian meddling in our elections in 2016. Uh, Congresswoman, as recently as this week, President Trump has called this a witch hunt that, that uh, Robert Mueller is on. Um, do you think that uh, Mueller's investigation is credible and should it continue? I, I definitely think that we need to know what the truth is. Uh, there's been a lot of allegations, but there's yet to be evidence. And so I think that um, Mueller needs to please please keep it down folks Mueller to needs to candidate. finish Thank this you. investigation as soon as possible and we need to make sure that we have confidence in our elections so that as a society that is in place and and we have taken steps to do that and I and I would do want to go back to the veterans question also I do not support privatizing the VA what I support is giving veterans an opportunity to seek care in the community. There's no reason that a veteran that lives in Republic Washington or Colville or Chewila or Colfax should have to come to the Spokane VA. I want to give them the option to seek care in the community where it makes sense. But the VA, we need the VA. And we need the VA to focus on what is priority. That's post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury and making sure that they get the mental health and the homelessness support that they need. And that will remain a top priority for me. Ms. Brown, the, the question for you on this is, at, at this point, uh, back to the Russia investigation, um, based on the information that has been revealed in this investigation, what do you think the next steps for the Democrats in on Capitol Hill should be? Well, we need the investigation to go forward unimpeded. And the issue isn't how fast it wraps up. The issue is getting the truth out there. And there have been indictments, and there are probably more to come. And we don't know for sure who knew what when in the administration or in the Trump campaign. But we do know, in fact, that Russia seriously interfered with our election system. And this Congress is not taking any action to make sure it doesn't happen again. And that's what we deserve. We deserve to have confidence in our election system. And furthermore, the Congresswoman has stated that we need to restore trust in our FBI and our top law enforcement institutions. Yes, we do. I have not lost trust in our top law enforcement institutions. And I believe most people in, in this country still have trust in them as well. We need to let them operate without the threat of impeaching Rod Rosenstein or uh, people being fired uh, because they're coming up with information that makes the administration uncomfortable. All right, let's Congresswoman. Well, so, so um, in, in fact, Congress has taken action. We have passed the strictest sanctions against Russia. This Congress, President Trump has signed them. We've taken action to ensure that our elections are going to be 
uh, um, not meddled in. And, and no one, no one should be above the law. If, and no one should use their positions for political purposes. And, and whether it's in the FBI or the Department of Justice, there have been too many examples where individuals are using their positions, they're abusing their power, and they are using their positions for political purpose. And that is wrong, and, it, and, we, and Congress is taking steps to hold them accountable and to make sure that that does not continue. Ms. Brown. The sanctions uh, are not being implemented, uh, and Congress is not taking action to hold the administration accountable for uh, implementing the law that was passed and signed by the president. And furthermore, there are much stronger actions that could be taken to safeguard our election system. We need campaign finance reform. Uh, we need uh, the Disclose Act. We need uh, to end dark money in politics. If we don't do that, we don't know where the money is coming from that are funneling into the negative ads you are seeing today in Eastern Washington. Do I get another rebuttal now? Uh, I think she got two. Did she get two? I believe she only got the one. No, I, we'll get to it. She got two. She got two. One, yes. 30 seconds. Okay, so I totally agree that we need more transparency as far as who's contributing to campaigns. Uh, the only dark money in this campaign right now is coming from some group in New York. I don't know if you're fami familiar with who they are. Um, the but Congressional Leadership Fund? No. Uh, they have, it is some group in New York. They, the Congressional Leadership Fund has not funded any campaign ads in this district. There's, a, there's an outside group. I'm not sure who they're funded by. Maybe George Soros. Um, but it is a, a, a pro-abortion group that's funding ads in this district. And, and yet you have not taken a stand against that dark money. If you believe in transparency, then you need to, you need to act in a transparent way. I hope we talk about that. We're going to focus on the farm bill. <laughs> we'll start with you, Ms. Brown. Okay. In Washington State, one in eight rely on food stamps. Many are finding that in jeopardy after the House last week passed a controversial portion of the farm bill requiring able-bodied adults to either work 20 hours or participate in a state-run training program. Critics claim that states don't have the manpower to ramp up management and will potentially cause low-income adults to lose benefits. If this does not get passed, it falls back on Congress. If elected, what is the fix? It is really unfortunate that for the first time since anyone can remember, uh, the House passed only a partisan farm bill. Fortunately, the Senate passed a bipartisan one, but we still don't have an agreement. Hence, we don't have a farm bill. It, it could even be that we end up with another continuing resolution that kicks the can down the road. Uh, I don't support the work requirements. They don't make sense in Northeast Washington. We certainly uh, should be providing training and work opportunities for all through our community college and training systems, but we don't need to create another bureaucratic mechanism which will actually result in cutting people off of the food assistance that they need. Furthermore, the biggest problem facing farmers is the reckless trade and tariff war that the administration is engaged in and that my opponent has expressed disappointment in, but again, Congress isn't taking action. The Constitution gives Congress the ability to levy tariffs, and this tariff war is devastating to eastern Washington wheat farmers and to ranchers. Representative McMorris Rogers, same question to you. What is the fix? Well, I'm, I'm proud to be a farm kid. I grew up on the farm. I'm proud that agriculture is the number one industry in eastern Washington. I am committed to making sure that we get a farm bill in place. We need a farm bill to give our farmers that certainty, especially with the uncertainty around trade. I have spoken out against the across-the-board uh, approach on the tariffs. We need trade agreements. But I'm also proud that this president is taking action against China on, the t on their um, practices right now. America, we're the innovators, but China's been copying our innovation and then selling it back to us. On the work requirements, you know, we're celebrating right now a booming economy all across this country. This is the ideal time to restore work requirements. We're not proposing any cuts. What we're proposing is that for individuals that are getting food stamps, that they, we would come alongside them and, and make sure that, and give them an opportunity to go back to school 20 hours a week, work 20 hours a week. It's a way to get them into the workforce and get them a job, which is the best anti pro poverty program, and it's the best health care program. Yep. Um, 
Could I uh, just follow up? I, on? I think we need to move Let's on. Let's move on. to the next one. We yes. get to enough-ish questions on this. Um, the uh, issue of this. It's been out there this weekend, specifically related to the current Supreme Court nominee for President Trump, Brett Kavanaugh. The scene is, weekend has seen new allegations of, of sexual assault by him dating back to the early 1980s. Uh, this first question is for Ms. Brown. What should be the next steps at Capitol Hill in his nomination process? Well, certainly there needs to be a full investigation of the allegation. And uh, the, the woman who has come forward needs, deserves to have an investigation done in an independent way and then to be heard. And the rush to judgment of uh, confirm as quickly as possible is not the right thing for a lifetime appointment. And it runs over the rights of women just like happened in 1991 when Anita Hill came forward with her allegations. That inspired a whole generation of women to run for office. I ran for office in 1992. And I predict that women in the United States want this to be thoroughly investigated without a quick confirmation. Representative McMorris Rogers, next step on the confirmation process. All right, well, we're working through the process. I think it's important that we give um, every woman an, op a, an opportunity to be heard. I think that that is very important. Uh, as my understanding, the Senate has scheduled a hearing for Monday where both uh, Kavanaugh and the accuser will be in front of the Senate and given a chance to be heard and to answer questions. And I think we just need to continue to allow this process to play out. Sean. Next issue I want to focus on is, uh, we'll start with you, Representative McMorris-Rogers, on tax reform. According to the New York Times, recent tax cuts, tax cuts have pushed the national deficit to $1 trillion. What is your plan to rein in spending? Well, my plan to rein in spending is both to get our economy going and growing, and then to also um, go through the federal budget and set priorities and make some tough decisions, get Congress living within its means. But we had, it's, it's a two-front approach. One is to get the economy growing. And just two years ago, people like President Obama was saying that the economy was tapped out, that it couldn't grow anymore, that we had to get used to this new normal. And today, we have more, peop more job openings than people on unemployment. And, and so this is good. Employers need a workforce and get more people in the workforce, get them paying you know, taxes, that's going to help. But then we also need, in Congress, I've supported the balanced budget amendment, I've supported other reforms. There's a budget reform uh, uh, committee right now, Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate are working on important budget process reforms because fundamentally the debt is a, a, big, um, is a big threat to this country and we, and we need to take action there uh, and the House is led in this effort. We do have to leave it there. Effort. We're out of time. I'm sorry. Ms. Brown, to you, the national deficit, $1 trillion. How, what would you do if elected to rein in spending? This Congress in the, in, the, in the last 11 months has engaged in the most fiscally irresponsible uh, policy in our nation's history. And it does not have its priorities straight. And so talking about a, a balanced budget down the road when you've just blown the door off the budget uh, is really disingenuous, in my opinion. And the priorities are wrong because the tax breaks that went to the people at the very top were uh, tens of thousands of dollars, more than most people make in eastern Washington. And the, the middle class uh, gets very little of that. And to add insult to injury, that was temporary with major corporate tax cuts being permanent. So there are things we could do to close the deficit, including things that President Trump used to support, like closing the carried interest loophole, like making sure that we're not giving tax incentives to companies that uh, offshore jobs uh, We do overseas. have to leave it there, Ms. Brown. We have to leave it there. Do I get a rebuttal? Uh, we're going to move on to the next question. The my question is on uh, gun control measures here in the district, um, specifically related, and I know I've asked you to this question before, but I want to ask it again um, in light of additional information on that kind of stuff. Um, many of these mass shootings that we see in, in this country are perpetrated by people armed with AR-15 style rifles. Sh Congresswoman, should Congress make some sort of attempt to ban the sale of those weapons, AR-15s? 
I, I, I am a strong defender of the Second Amendment. What we need to do is focus on ensuring that those weapons do not get into the hands of those that should not have them. And when you look at the shootings, when you look at these examples, an example after example, the, the person, whether it was Sutherland Springs, whether it was in Florida, these are individuals that should not have had those guns to begin with. And we need to make sure that people do not slip through the, the cracks. Um, I have supported in Congress legislation to get our NICS system, the federal database system, into a better place so that it's, there's better coordination with the military, with the states, so that individuals that should not have access to guns do not get them. But we should not be taking away guns from law-abiding citizens. We need to make sure that we enforce the laws such that those that should not have access don't. Ms. Brown, same question to you. Well, one of the saddest things that's occurred uh, in the last year in this campaign is having students stand up and say they're afraid to go to school. And they have a reason to be afraid um, when gun violence is the second uh, major cause of death of young people in the United States of America. And this Congress is not doing its job to improve school safety and reduce gun violence. We, we could certainly start with a complete background check system and, and uh, waiting periods for people purchasing guns and creating responsibility for those who let guns get out of their control into the hands of people who shouldn't have them. And frankly, the, also the uh, assault style weapons could be much more stringently regulated. We don't even have a national uh, gun trafficking statute. And this is about preventing criminal activity. And uh, I certainly support the Second Amendment and grew up in a rural family, understand the role of I'm, guns in I'm, our society. I understand the, the statement. Uh, we need to uh, okay. finish it up, but can I, I, can I ask, I didn't hear an answer to the, would you support banning the sale of those? And I said what I would support, okay. which is a strict regulation, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Licensing and strict regulation, as well as um, there are many other uh, less controversial measures that the majority of gun owners, responsible gun owners, as most are, agree to. And this Congress is not acting, and I, I don't need to tell you why, I think people know why no action is being taken. Extra time, so Congresswoman. Okay, in, in fact, this Congress has act. This, this Congress, as I said, we have taken action. It, this took years to get the update to the, the federal database. This Congress has acted in providing support to our schools. The Stop School Violence Act, which is, is going to help our schools with resources. You know, I went out to Freeman after the high school shooting here. I have talked to other administrators and students in Eastern Washington, and yes, I, I want them to be safe and secure. I have young kids that are in schools. I think about this. But let's focus on what's actually going to get results, not just rhetoric. Let's get results in helping our schools with the resources for mental health counselors, for training, for um, assistance with local law enforcement to be able to be more coordinated. Those are the kind of actions that are actually going to get results. Sean, move on to the, the next question. I want to move to the issue of homelessness. So we've seen in the major cities, Portland, all on the West Coast, Seattle, it's exploding. They don't have a remedy. It is such a complex issue. Now, despite the increase in Washington State minimum wage, it can't keep up with the rising cost of housing. The state's predicting a major shortfall in 2019. That means some simply might find themselves out of their homes on the streets looking for shelter. What is your long-term sustainable solution to what is no doubt a complex issue? I will start with you, Representative McMorris Rogers. I think it's her turn. Right? Okay. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll start with the VA because I think our hearts really go out when we see the veterans that are on the street corners. And we need to make sure that we are, uh, as a community, taking steps to help those that find themselves in a homeless situation. You know, right now, there are vouchers available to these veterans, and yet the VA isn't getting them processed in time. And that breaks my heart. So that is, that's one issue that I'm working on right now in this community. 
I am proud of this community for the work that it has done to come together to address homelessness. And it's been, it's been a joint effort uh, at, the, at the city, state, nonprofits that are involved in addressing homelessness. You know, because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and, and, um, and people having more resources, more money, both families and companies, the Hope House, for example, here in Spokane got a million dollars to help with the expansion of the Hope House. You know, I was down there visiting and saw women that needed shelter out on the sidewalk. And again, this is an example where you, you give people more money in their pockets, they're gonna invest it in the community and address the needs here. We do have to leave okay. it there, we are out of time. Very good. Ms. Brown, how do you remedy the homeless problem? So complex, we're seeing it explode, how do you remedy it? Well, I agree it's complex and uh, people require more than just housing assistance. They definitely need help with their health care and mental health challenges and the whole complex of issues. And we have made progress in this community. However, um, this Congress has its priorities backwards and is not investing in the appropriate level of state, uh, local, and federal government partnerships that could be utilized to address the homeless population. I hear the Congresswoman talking every day about how great the uh, the tax cut bill was. It's almost as if she doesn't live here in Eastern Washington because rents are going up and healthcare costs are going up. And in fact, uh, people are very concerned about their ability to afford um, their rent as um, the costs rise. And we need that investment to be made at the federal level. And it's not enough just to pretend like everything's great. We also have our priorities We do have wrong. to leave it there, but I am gonna allow you a rebuttal on this. Okay, uh, well, the best thing we can do is to get someone a job. And right here in Eastern Washington, 12,000 new jobs. Uh, wages have increased three to nine percent just in the last year in every single one of the counties that I represent. Counties that have historically had double-digit unemployment. This is good news. This is making a difference in people's lives. They have an opportunity for a better life. They have an opportunity to have a job so that they can afford uh, a better home and, and that they can afford health insurance. Although we do need to take steps to bring down the cost of health insurance and I have some ideas. Ms. Brown? Well, real wages, which is adjusted after inflation, have not risen to that level. And to some extent, that is because of the increased minimum wage in Washington state is why that wages have risen in every county in Washington state. Uh, in addition to that, uh, an infrastructure program could support more economic activity in rural Washington, which, has be, it, which is in many ways left behind with the higher unemployment rates. And so again, the priorities of this Congress have been clear, huge national deficit, uh, lots of benefits for people at the top, lots of rhetoric about everybody else, but not the actual following through with the resources needed to actually make families' lives improved. Are we ready for audience questions, or do we continue going? If you have another question. I, I, have have another I think question. we have time for one more. We got time for one more. I figured you would. <laughs> Let's make it about um, uh, Social Security, because that's been an issue that's come up here, covered in the Social uh, Spokesman Review this weekend. This question is for you first, uh, uh, Ms. Brown. The recent trustees report that was out the, earlier this summer showed that for the first time this year, the program will spend more than it receives in interest and payments in, and it faces uh, reduction in benefits if no, potential reduction in benefits if no action is taken by 2034. Do you believe the program is financially viable? And if not, what would you do to change it? Social Security is a commitment. It's a multi-generational commitment. It's a promise that we make. We all pay into it and we all benefit from it. And so it's a question of political priorities. If we need to shore up or transfer funds into the trust fund where funds may have been uh, uh, taken before, then that's a commitment that Congress needs to make. And I don't support the, uh, uh, the idea that we should let have that we should have young people diverting their pay into the system into private funds that are riskier not a promise uh, that has been made and would start would further undermine uh, the trust fund and the system congresswoman same question okay I 
I believe that Social Security is a promise that we have made and that we must maintain. There's only one person talking about any, any thing about Social Security in this campaign, and it's really my opponent. I don't support any cuts to Social Security. There's no one in Washington, D.C. The President has made it very clear that there will not be any changes to Social Security. So for, for anyone out there that is concerned, there, this is not going to happen. And I want to go back to tax cuts. You know, for, for hardworking men and women in, the, in Eastern Washington, they do have more money in their pocket, on average $2,000. You know what that means? It means that they're also um, getting better paying jobs and they're paying more into Social Security. So this is another positive of, of giving people more jobs, better paying jobs, right here in Eastern Washington, that they can help um, uh, the, the income into so the money going into Social Security is actually up. And again, it, I, I believe that it is because of our economy and the job creation that we see right here in Eastern Washington. People are hopeful and optimistic again. It's, it's a 20 year high. We need to get to another question. We, we are also, for all of you that are watching on um, live television, we have audience questions that will be coming up to wrap up the hour. I do want to get to one more question for both of the candidates. Uh, Everybody that lives in the 5th Congressional District right now is inundated with ads. Obviously, you both know uh, this is a very, very hard-fought race. I want to ask you uh, your reaction, and I will be begin with you, Ms. Brown, to the ads of Liberal Lisa, just like Pelosi. Your response. Uh, the truth matters, and these personal attacks are a distraction from the issues. And I think because the Congresswoman's record on health care and things people really care about isn't that good is why we are seeing these attacks. The voters deserve better. And we can have, I'd love to have three or four more questions about our solutions to health care and our voting records. Because the distortion is not only about my record, it's about her record. She's applauded the Paul Ryan budget that calls for entitlement reform. And saying that the president has taken something off the table does not mean that she hasn't supported these Social Security privatization moves in the past or might not support them again in the future. And that's why I think we need more of these types of forums. Um, she hasn't agreed to a forum on a college campus campus, I'd like to challenge her to either accept the one that has been offered by the African American ministers or to uh, meet in another forum on a college campus so we could hear from the students in our district and answer their questions as well. All right, to Representative McMorris Rogers, the ads against you, out of touch, unreachable, can't meet her face to face. Well, it's simply not true. I, I, do, I do more town halls than most members of Congress. It is, I'm actually, if you check please, the record. Please keep it down, please. If you check the record, respond. I do, I'm in the top uh, as far as a representative that does town halls. It's actually Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell that don't do town halls. It's Senator Murray and Cantwell that won't debate their opponent. I've, I make it a priority to be accessible. I think it's pretty basic to being a representative, and I travel around this district, I am proud of my record of results for the people of Eastern Washington. Everything from healthcare, um, working on the residency program so that we'll have more doctors in Eastern Washington, working on forest management reform in a bipartisan way uh, with Senator Cantwell, uh, working on um, giving kids with disabilities more opportunities. I am someone that digs in, understands the issues, and gets results. And I just would encourage people to check my record. Um, we do have to leave okay. it there, but we do have time for rebuttal. I will say that if we're going to talk about Senator Murray, she's done a lot for veterans, and I would look forward to working with her and Senator Cantwell on uh, issues like that. And also, uh, the, the question really is, uh, are we paying attention to what, are we solving problems? It's not the, again, the number of bills that you pass. It's the ones that matter to take on the issues that people really care about. And there has been no meaningful progress on health care. In fact, it's rolling backwards and people know it. Their premiums are going up. Prescription there, drug costs are not being addressed. But the Congresswoman does get a chance to respond. Um, I, I want to go back to the ads because... I, um, you know, I want everyone to know I am not 
proposing, nor have I supported any cuts to Medicare or Social Security. Uh, I am concerned about dark money in politics, the amount of money in politics. I am someone that is very transparent as far as who's supporting my campaign. In fact, ever since I first started running for Congress, I have listed every single person who's contributed to my campaign, not just, even those that are under $200. We do uh, have to leave it there so we can get to the audience questions. Thank you for following the time cues. More. We, we've all gotten better as we've gone along with the time cues. Now to our first audience question that was pre-recorded as people were coming into the Bing tonight. My name is Bremo Nyinkwan. I'm originally from South Sudan. I came to U.S. Uh, 14 years ago through uh, legal migration. I have a question to Representative Lisa, uh, Representative uh, Kathy McMorris. My question is, do you agree with President Trump's immigration policies or policy? If you don't, what are they? The policy that you disagree with him? Okay. So I agree that we need to secure our border. Um, that is the first step. Look at the drugs, the human trafficking even right now coming across the border. But I've also supported reforms in Congress to fix a broken immigration system. When you look at who's coming to this country legally today, 90% are either refugees or family reunification. We need to fix a broken immigration system so that those that want to come here legally, want to pursue the American dream, can do so. And I've supported a merit-based visa that would address, that would give DACA, the undocumented DACA, um, individuals right now, a path to become legal, a merit-based visa based upon being in school, being in the military, or working, so that you can have a legal status, it would become a, a permanent status, and then ultimately they could get in line and seek citizenship if they would like to do that. These are, um, I voted for that in the House, it came up a little bit short, but we're not giving up. All right, to our next audience question. Can I respond to that? Uh, we'll go to the next question. That's a big issue, that immigration issue. I hope I get a chance to respond to it because it's a big one. It's important. I am Shannon Kozlovich. I live in Spokane. I'm the president of the Health Sciences Student Advocacy Association from WSU Spokane. My question is, Washington State now has a legal product that our public universities are not allowed to study. With all of the questions surrounding marijuana, where it can help and where it can harm an individual, how do each of you propose to lift the restrictions on marijuana research at public universities? We'll start with Ms. Brown. Great, and I just want to say this Congress is not keeping its promise to dreamers. And it's been a year now, and we need to address that issue. I'm sorry, it's just so important. And the separation of, of children from parents at the border, and Congress is not standing up to them on that issue. Oh, yeah, there's when it comes to the issue, I, I can't. It's too important, and this Congress is letting us down. When it comes to the issue of cannabis, I believe that we should allow our research universities to do that research. I supported that at the state level. I also believe that Congress should be passing the bill that would allow veterans uh, access to medicinal marijuana. And I do believe the federal government should allow states that have voter approved and regulated uh, cannabis markets, the federal government should stay out of that. And Congress could pass a law that would in fact make that the case for the states that have passed those laws. And the audience member did ask the question to both candidates. Okay. We, we do need to research this issue more. I think that um, you know, we're, we're learning more. We're on the cutting edge. Washington State was one of the first to legalize both recreational and medicinal marijuana. And there's some positive outcomes as it relates to health care. There's still concerns when you look at the number of fatalities, car fatalities that involve someone um, that has been um, using marijuana. So, but bottom line, I want us to do more research. I'm excited about bringing more research to Eastern Washington. I, 
I mentioned that I worked on the 21st Century Cures legislation. Uh, I'm proud to have helped get three times the research dollars for Alzheimer's. Uh, we need to be, lead I want America to lead the world in research and in cures and breakthroughs and do it right here in Eastern Washington with uh, what is what's happening right here? So this is this is an exciting time and we should be focusing on what we can be doing and bringing right here and Part of my work in Congress will help make that happen. Right, let's get to the next audience question I'm Jonathan Weiser. I live here in Spokane We have occupied Afghanistan for 17 years now The mission there is not clear to me at this point. So I'm wondering what you consider victory in Afghanistan to be? What does victory in Afghanistan look like? And how do you plan to get us to that victory? Thank you. We'll, we'll pose that question to both candidates. Ms. Brown, we'll begin with you. Well, I think that this administration uh, needs to work with Congress and with allies uh, on solutions to end these interminable conflicts that we're involved in that take American lives and also drain resources without getting the results that we say that we have gone in there for. We obviously have to protect our national security. Um, we have to uh, track down uh, terrorists and protect uh, our uh, Americans, both here and abroad. But the biggest failure of this current administration is um, dismissing our allies and our neighbors, um, uh, insulting NATO countries, rather than figuring out how to come up with multilateral. We live in a, a planet that is we are all neighbors with each other, and we need an administration that doesn't just uh, insult and withdraw um, un unless it's uh, Putin, but actually time, join together. Congresswoman, your response to the question. Well, I, I think it's a very good question, and there's, there's not an easy answer. I think it is important that we are clear about what is our mission today in Afghanistan. But I do think it's important to go back and remember why we got into Afghanistan to begin with. And it was in the aftermath of 9-11. It was to ensure that there were not safe havens for terrorists. It was to ensure that the Taliban did not continue to have a place where they could organize and plan further attacks. So um, I, it's been a long time. I think we do need to clarify what we think the outcome can be. I've had the chance to go to Afghanistan. It's a tough assignment. Uh, Afghanistan is very different than America. And, um, and we need, and, but I am proud that this Congress made a priority to rebuild our military. Give, our, give the support that we need to our troops. Make sure that when we're asking them to go forward, that they actually have the support, the training, and that they're ready to do the tasks that we are asking them to do. All right, let's get to the next audience question. My name is Lily Navarrete, and this uh, question is for Kathy McMorris Rogers. Why did you support Spokane's Proposition 1 in 2017, which we would allow city employees to inquire about immigrants' legal status? And why do you support the jailing and detention of immigrants who are just seeking to seek a better life? Well, I have, you know, it's been heartbreaking to see what was happening at the border. I have, I have voted for legislation. I have um, voted for legislation and I've um, said that the administration should keep these families together. But we need to expedite and make sure that we uh, work through that legal process as soon as possible. Clearly, we need to be doing a better job at the border, and this goes to the importance of border security, making sure that we as a country have um, the safety and security as citizens, and then um, taking steps for those that want to come here to be able to do so legally. Um, but it, it's heartbreaking to see what's been happening at the border. I have stood against that, and I have introduced legislation and supported legislation to make sure that the families would be kept together. This is another example where the, the dark money ads that had said that I'm not doing anything are not factual and they're not truthful. And because they're uh, in the issue of fairness, two questions were posed to the Congresswoman. We'll let you respond to this question. Well, the reality is that this Congress has failed to pass anything on immigration. 
and the congresswoman talks about a bill she supported, but it was negotiation between two wings of the House Republican Caucus. There are enough votes today to pass the DREAM Act. The rug was pulled out from under these young people. I've met with them at WSU and at Whitworth, and they don't have a path forward right now. And we are essentially putting them in jeopardy because of the actions of their parents. This Congress could solve that when she heads back to Washington, D.C., but I predict it's not happening until after the next election. Kip, to your final question on the broadcast portion. Yes, uh, this is going to wrap things up here on the, the broadcast end. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, Congresswoman, I believe you went first, so I'll ask this, this question of you to, to finish off here. What message would you like voters in the audience and watching at home to take away from tonight's forum? Well, thank you, Kip. <laughs> I... Uh, I'm proud to be someone who has worked hard, listened, and, and gotten results. And I make it a priority to get around this district to understand the issues and whether it is, I'm proud that we got forest management reform. We fixed fire borrowing, uh, the work that I've done to help kids with disabilities. I'm proud to have led the effort on the Teaching Health Center, GME. This is the residency program for the doctors. You know, I met a, I met a guy just a few weeks ago who came here from California to do his residency in, in Spokane, and he stayed, and he stayed here for 30 years. You know, I'm excited about the medical schools, and I, and you know, and many were a part of it. Lisa and other community leaders, and Dr. Elson Floyd, but the residency program is very important, also, because we don't want them doing their residencies in California or other places in the country. We want them doing it right here, and I'm working with the VA. We'll have more residencies at the VA. The, the VA has consistently had a very difficult time hiring doctors. Uh, if we can get more residencies and there, there will be I'm more doctors, and then there, we can get that emergency. Yep. Appreciate it. Yep. Please, Ms. Brown, same question to you. If it was just about the talking points, then I would probably vote for Kathy, but it's not about the talking points. It's about results in Congress, and it's not good enough to be in the majority and to be a leader in Congress and not deliver on the things that people really care about in Eastern Washington. I know how to work with Republicans and Democrats and business and community leaders and get things done, from the Eastern Washington Veterans Cemetery uh, to the Fox Theater to Roads and Bridges and Water Projects in Southeast Washington. That's the kind of leadership we need in Congress right now. I want you to know that in Congress, I will continue to live here. I will continue to, to uh, be engaged with the community. I'm, I'm not entering this for a career, but for another chapter of public service to continue to improve health care for the people of Eastern Washington, as I was able to do in the state legislature and able to do in the, in the, in the most uh, rewarding chapter of my public life, which was helping to, to build the health science campus Need and to create leave it there, the medical Ms. Brown. school. We are out of time. Thank I you. do want to say uh, thank you to both of the candidates for the hour-long uh, conversation on the in-depth issues. Thanks to both of you for being there and showing Eastern Washington how it's done. And anybody that's watching across the nation, thanks to both of the candidates for being here and all of you being here. I do want to say uh, we do have some more audience questions for the candidates to respond to. If you are interested in listening to those, uh, feel free to stay. And also on KHQ.com and SpokesmanReview.com, on behalf of Kip Hill, the spokesman, I'm Sean Allison for KHQ. You can follow us on social media right now as we're going to continue the conversation past 7 o'clock. Thanks for being with us on KHQ.